This is Jeffrey Sachs, editor of Tradition. Usually, I host our podcast, but recently I had the microphone turned on me and became the subject of an interview as part of the series we're co-producing with Rav Alon Meltzer and the Or Hadash community in Sydney, Australia. Each week has featured a conversation with one of the authors in our recent Rabbi Norman Lamb Memorial volume exploring different aspects of contemporary modern orthodoxy as reflected in Rabbi Lamb's writings. For this episode, I was joined by Jackie Seaman Charek of Or Hadash, who asked me about my own contribution, The Extremes Are More Consistent But Absurd, which explored Rabbi Lamb's writings on religious moderation as the hallmark of our community. It was also a chance to talk about what we've been doing recently at Tradition, and how the journal has evolved over the decades, while remaining loyal to Rabbi Lamb's founding vision from 1958. Visit Tradition's YouTube channel for the archives of all episodes in the series, and visit traditiononline.org to read my essay and others in the volume, and to subscribe to our journal of Orthodox Jewish thought. I'd like to start the conversation off by um, handing Rabbi Sachs this question. Um, obviously, we've designed a whole series around the memorial volume for Rabbi Lamb. So I wanted to ask if you could share the impetus for that volume. How did it come about? What does it represent to you and, and to the to tradition itself, I guess? Well, thanks very much, Jackie. Be before I answer your question, I'll just add a word of thanks. You know, just as I know all of the participants in this series are glad to be with you all uh, down under. Um, and uh, so it's a great opportunity for us to to get to you without the very serious uh, trouble that's involved in actually getting to you uh, physically. So it's nice to be with you, and we're very, we're very uh, appreciative of the work of your community in trying to bring the work of tradition uh, down to down to your congregants and your members, and and indeed to all of the many people around the world who've been listening to these sessions live on Zoom and afterwards uh, through the tradition. Uh, website. So, so thank you for that. Uh, like you said, this was a very particularly uh, special issue of tradition who in its 64 year history um, uh, has had a number of special issues, but this one really stands out. I mean, just besides the fact that it's, it's, it's quite large, it's the largest single issue we've put out. It came out in, in hardcover in a, in a special design in memory of Rabbi Norman Lamb who, as you've heard in some of the previous sessions, was a very remarkable figure on the scene of, of American orthodoxy and worldwide, worldwide Judaism as a thinker, theologian, philosopher, speaker, expositor, communal leader, fundraiser, institution builder, et cetera, et cetera, principally from his perch as president of Yeshiva University for I think nearly a quarter century, uh, but in many other undertakings that he was involved with uh, throughout his his long career, he really did help shape the the contours of what this movement called modern orthodoxy is. And in in my essay in the volume, I I speak to that a little bit. What what the name of the religious spiritual community is and why that either matters or doesn't matter, but whatever we call it, and for the purpose of our, our conversation, let's call it modern orthodoxy. He really did shape the contours of that community, but also to fill it with ideas, both form and more significantly content to help a religious community over the course of a half century of involvement with trying to explore these ideas and push people to, to consider them and to explore the meaning of ideas for actual lived religious life, there are really no other figures we could point to with that breadth and depth uh, who, who, you know, led a, a community in that way. On top of that, he was the founding editor of our journal in 1958, together with a small group of other people, Rabbi Lamb founded tradition as the first journal of Orthodox Jewish thought uh, that existed in the English, in the English speaking world. I know that our friend uh, uh, Rabbi Dr. Zev Elif is going to be a guest on the in the series uh, in a number of weeks, and he can speak to this better than I about what was happening in American Orthodox Orthodoxy in the 1950s 
uh, that uh, that it was significant to create the journal and what was involved in getting the journal going. It was a, a, a number of years it took them to actually get it off off the ground. But briefly, it was an idea that for the religious community to take itself seriously, it had to have a platform where it could explore the ideas and the scholarship and produce ideas and scholarship and, and be a platform where, where uh, orthodox thinkers and writers could be sharing their ideas um, that wasn't at all available. It's impossible for us today uh, 64 years later to imagine such a world. I mean, we live in a world which is saturated with media. I mean, everybody owns their own print. Anybody with a computer or even, or even just a, a smartphone, you know, owns their own printing press, as it were. We have no shortage. On the contrary, we have too many opportunities to share our, our thoughts with, with everyone. We could probably do, do a, a lot better with, uh, with fewer people sharing their, their half-baked thoughts on, on social media and on blogs and, and uh, et cetera. Uh, but back in the, in the 50s, that wasn't the case. Uh, there not only weren't there enough platforms, but there wasn't enough openness to be publishing uh, learned, engaged, scholarly writings from within an orthodox perspective about issues related to Torah, about issues related to society. And when Rabbi Lamb uh, launched tradition, it quickly became that platform. And then very quickly, it became a, uh, a, a venue in which some of the most significant writers in, in the community, principally in North America, but from around the world, were publishing their writing. And first amongst them, of course, was Rabbi Soloveitchik, who published of the essays that Rabbi Soloveitchik wrote in his own hand in English, tradition was the most significant platform for their dissemination. I'm thinking first and foremost of the lonely man of faith, you know, perhaps the most significant, the most significant work of Jewish thought written and published in the United States in the 20th century, originally appeared as a long essay in tradition. And only many years later in the 1990s, was it uh, published in book form and disseminated the way that it's known that it's known today. And that, as well as many other uh, shorter essays, uh, were published in our pages. And, and that was part of Rabbi Lamb's achievement. Uh, he was very young. He was in his 30s when he launched uh, tradition. It's impossible to imagine the, 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 sheer, uh, the sheer gumption that it took uh, to, to do that, to create that, and to succeed. Uh, but, you know, certainly, uh, in recognition to that contribution, we felt it was appropriate to put together a, a memorial volume. So that, that's the, the short answer for why we did it. But I think just as interestingly is the question of how we did it. And, and this is actually something that I'm quite proud of, you know, for what we do together in tradition. And let me be clear, I am not alone at tradition. We have a, a, a board of people that are actively engaged in, in everything that we, that we do, both in the quarterly print journal, as well as as well as on, on the website where we produce digital content on a regular basis. Um, but as editor of this particular volume, I'm, I'm very proud of how we conceived it. You know, very often there are these, you know, memorial volumes or, or tribute volumes to different figures in, in academia, in the rabbinate, in Jewish life, in culture, etc. And very often they're um, a loose gathering of people that have some connection to the honoree or people that are involved in the field that the honoree has distinguished him or herself who write articles that get you know held together between between two covers but the articles themselves don't necessarily hang together and as is the nature of any uh, collection of essays it's usually somewhat uneven but here we conceived it differently instead of asking people to contribute articles from their own field uh, in honor of rabbi lamb we took Rabbi Lamb's writing and made that the focus so that the book is kind of collectively an interpretation and an engagement with his vast body of, of writing, his published record, but also his, his spoken record, because many, many hundreds of his sermons, which was a, a, a medium in which he, in which he distinguished himself, he was he was the uh, unparalleled uh, orator 
uh, on the Jewish scene uh, throughout his, his day. He called himself the unrepentant darshan, the unrepentant uh, uh, sermonizer. Um, so those sermons uh, are, have all been digitized. The texts have been digitized and are available on the website of the Lamb Heritage Archives, which are housed on the website of, of Yeshiva University. And that serves as an additional significant um, uh, uh, text, which can be mined. And we turned to, in the end, there were 33 essays in the book, and we turned to leading figures, uh, teachers and, and, and teachers and philosophers and thinkers and communal leaders and rabbis and Rashi Yeshiva and people that themselves have involvement in the many spheres that Rabbi Lamb distinguished himself. And we asked them to write about a particular component of the man's thought. So looking at just the, the vast array of topics that he, that he covered, we were able to turn to other, other people who are today experts in those areas, who today are continuing the work to think about what did Rabbi Lamb have to say about this in his groundbreaking essay on the topic in 1960 or 1970 or 19, 19, 1980. What is its ongoing relevance for today? What were the factors on the ground back then that motivated him to the positions? Why did he stake out those claims? So, for example, in the last two weeks, your, your guests here on the program were Rona Novik, who heads the School of Education at Yeshiva University, to explore his writings on, on education. Uh, it was a topic that was very important to him, even though he, was, he himself was never a, a, a school teacher, an elementary or high school teacher. He understood that schooling is the main engine, uh, primary school, secondary school, and of course, higher education at Yeshiva University, that schooling is the engine through which a community fulfills its most important task to replicate itself, to, to create an ongoing, an ongoing uh, population that will carry on the values of of the community. And it was something that he turned his attention to and he wrote about and he spoke about and he met with teachers and he went to, to meet with, with school leaders. And we have you know, his record of, of, of essays and speeches and public lectures. And we could turn to a contemporary writer to explore that. Or two weeks ago, you had, you had Rabbanit Hannah Henkin from Nishmat to talk about his, his writings about women's education and women's leadership and roles in the in the community and and so on and and so forth, we were able to turn to people to do that. Um, uh, and the the essay, the, the the collection together, is almost like a reader's guide to the topics that Rabbi Lamb explored through the prism of his own writing. There aren't too many other figures where, if we were to set up worthy figures all, but if we were to set out to prepare a volume in their honor that we would be able to look to the bookshelf they left behind and we would be enabled to mine that written record to produce a similar volume. The, the only person, the only other person I could possibly think of would be Rabbi Jonathan Sachs, who we unfortunately also lost, you know, in this same terrible period of, of, of COVID, uh, we lost two great, two great leaders. Uh, and maybe Rabbi Sachs left behind a similar record. Unfortunately, Rabbi Sachs was slated to author one of the essays in this book about Rabbi Lamb's volume Torah Umada. There aren't too many people uh, well as, as well suited as Rabbi Sachs was to write about Rabbi Lamb's uh, take on Torah Umada, the, the intersection, the interaction between Torah learning and worldly scholarship. Unfortunately, Rabbi Sachs uh, did not live to to, um, to author that piece. And instead we were able to include a, a previous essay that he had written on the topic in the, in the volume. Uh, but uh, looking at the table of contents, you'll just see the array of, of things that uh, Rabbi Lamb himself was engaged with and the very impressive roster of contemporary writers that were able to take that on. Some of whom I should add are members of the distinguished Lamb family. Rabbi Lamb's own uh, children, grandchildren, uh, in-laws, uh, nephews, uh, and people who have gone on to make their own contributions to Jewish life and, and learning. And we were pleased to be able to involve them in the project as well. All of them, of course, are, are worthy 
of figures and scholars in their in their own right, and we hope that actually brings them a, a measure of comfort to the family who suffered a, a staggering double loss of uh, of Rabbi and Mrs. Lamb in very uh, in very close succession one to the other. So that was a Jackie apologies. That was a bit of a long winded answer to your question of why we did it, but I think more important how we how we went about doing it and, and why the volume really, I think, will stand the test of time as, a, as an enduring contribution to allow people to engage with these topics in 20th century Jewish thought. But it, it's, uh, it, 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 the way you describe it, I think it, it, I understand even better than before that it, it, it's really a, a compendium of his thoughts, but interpreted, as exactly. we saw with Ron and Avic last week, interpreted through the, through the lens and the thinking of uh, people that, that work, teach, live in the areas of his thought and, and take, take on those thoughts in their own lives and their own work, which, which is fascinating, it's fascinate, it's fascinating in and of itself. So I, I guess if you can sum that up, what, what is a, that's what the reader takes away from the whole volume, but is there also, is there a, is there a bigger message? I mean, you spoke at the beginning about tradition as the vehicle for the framework for a modern Orthodox community. Is, is, it, is it reshaping that? That well, as well is what, what else is, is in the what right, you want people right. to take away from it. Right. Well, again, I think that in this we remain, although you know, like any any journal, any publication, uh, you know, over over many decades, uh, we've evolved. Uh, there there are areas of focus and concern that present themselves in each generation uh, that we have to look at. You know that we have to look at you know anew or which we couldn't possibly have imagined in in years past and have to have to get to and explore uh for the first time um but i think that we've remained very loyal to his initial to his initial uh vision for what the the journal set out to be i, I wrote about this briefly in the introduction to the volume uh but tradition I has always I'm sorry. That that's my next question. In, in the uh, you 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 um anticipated your next question. You did. You did. Right. That um, um, that he begins at the end of his career to look retrospectively at his role within modern orthodoxy. Modern orthodoxy. So so in a sense, what you've described is a retrospective of his work. Um, but can you elaborate on that thought? So he um, uh, tradition, you know, as he set it out in the fifties occupied a kind of curious position. Um, this was true when it was the, the only show in town, and it remains true even though we live in a media landscape where there are many, uh, many uh, competing uh, publications, print and digital, uh, for the attention and minds of, of members of our community and members of the, the larger Jewish world. Tradition, I, I always say tradition is not an academic journal. It's a scholarly journal. What's the difference? An academic journal usually lives within a very narrow academic field. And it's speaking to people in that field, or it's, a, it's an arena in which people in that field can talk amongst themselves, can share their scholarship, can share their research, whether, whether it's in the humanities or it's in the, in the sciences. It's people that are dealing with geriatric osteoporosis. I have no doubt that if you Googled right now, you would find that there is a journal of geriatric osteoporosis. I, I'm, I'm almost certain. I don't know for sure, but if you Google it, you'll, you'll find it. It's almost like mad libs. You can take the word journal of, fill in an adjective and a noun, and, and there's probably a, a journal for it. And it's a little arena in which people are, are exploring things, or the journal of, uh, of, uh, of uh, you know, uh, early Aramaic, uh, early Aramaic uh, uh, grammar. Uh, it's a rather narrow field, but if you're working in that field, it's important that you have a place to, to meet intellectually meet uh, your, your colleagues and your students and share your, your research and your scholarship. If there are people outside the field that want to eavesdrop on that conversation, they're usually more than welcome. But that's not the role of tradition. Yes, tradition is a place where we want academics as well as people that are more um, engaged with the wider world outside of the ivory tower to feel that they can and should be publishing and sharing their writing. 
But I say tradition is not an academic journal, but it is a scholarly journal. It's a place that maintains scholarly standards where we're writing, if, if, if the journal arrives in your mailbox, printed on dead trees, and you're going to give it time to engage sometimes with a, a rather lengthy, lengthy uh, essay on, on some topic that to an outsider might seem abstruse, but, but you as a member of the religious community understand why this is an important issue. It's an important issue in communal life. It's an important issue in, in, in the religious challenges that face us. So it's an important issue in the realm of, of Torah study broadly defined. This is something that I need to understand, that I want to, that I'm curious about, that, that has meaning for my life. Uh, it should be shaping the conversation within a larger religious community and not just within a narrow academic uh, discipline. So, so that's, that's what I would say by way of answer to, you know, what did he set out to do and what are we still, you know, that's the yardstick by which we, we, measure, we measure ourselves uh, in terms of what kind of material we solicit, what kind of material we're interested in, in publishing. And I think that's actually reflected very nicely in his own large bibliography, Rabbi Lamb's own large bibliography, the things that he was writing and publishing and speaking about over his, his career that are analyzed in this particular, uh, in this particular book. Thank you. Um, I'd like to turn to your own chapter in, in this mm -hmm. volume of tradition, the extremes, the extremes are more consistent but absurd. Um, and you, you look there at Rabbi Lamb's presentation at the term modern orthodoxy itself and right. the various tensions that, that the concept suffers from all sides. Um, can you share something about your piece with us in your own words and, and your, your thoughts about what um, you've written? So I, in my essay, I explored a, a cluster of, of his essays and sermons and more public speeches about the meaning of the religious community that he led, which without going into the, the history about which I mentioned, and you know, you can check my footnotes for for all of that, but we'll leave that aside of how the community took on this name, modern orthodoxy, and what happened when he tried to shift it away to a different meaning, uh, but ultimately with his frustration at uh, you know the the kind of the distraction that's involved in trying to figure out what do we call ourselves. That ultimately, that's not the most important question. You know, very often uh, communities, religious communities and other communities and other organizations are not named by their adherents, but adopt names that are, that are ascribed from the outside. I mean, the most famous example, of course, are the misnagdim, the opponents of Hasidut, uh, that great 18th century spiritualist movement, are called the opponents. It was a name that was given to them by, their, by the outsiders. Um, Ultimately, the name of any community is not as significant as what the community stands for. So modern orthodoxy, which historically in the 19th uh, and early 20th century had meant something very, very different, by mid-century comes to describe the community that you and I and presumably all of our listeners today know what it is. Commitment to halakha, absolute commitment to halakha. Uh, but in openness to the world. In other words, as distinguished from our brothers and sisters to the right of us in the what today has come to be termed the Haredi world or the ultra-Orthodox ultra world, uh, we maintain an openness to general culture, to general society. How we do that is a subject of negotiation. To what degree we succeed in... Um, in digesting the best that has been thought and said in general culture uh, towards our spiritual prophet is something which we could, in a different conversation, uh, analyze and grade ourselves on, on how, how well we do that. There are, of course, other characteristics of the religious community, uh, not just culture, but of course, general education, but general education, not merely as a kind of, you know, profit motive or some kind of vocational vocational um, uh, necessity that in order to have a job, you know, you need to have some kind of, 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 of education, some kind of career training. He, he actually on, on one occasion 
uh, on one occasion referred to that vocational vocational model and um, incentive as the the lowest uh, the lowest form of of rational. He called it the the lamest of all apologetics, the vocational necessity of general education, uh, as the lamest, the least uh, significant of the motives to seek general education. Um, Zionism, the religious meaning of the modern state state of Israel, of course, has been one. Ahavat Yisrael was a theme that he emphasized uh, very many times. Uh, the idea that that our religious commitments mean that we recognize the common connection and cause of all Jewish people, no matter where they are and no matter what, no matter what religious community. Uh, or sub-community or denomination they belong to or don't belong to, for that matter, that part of the Jewish mission, uh, part of our religious spiritual makeup is a commitment to Judaism and Jews, wherever they may be, Jews that look like us, Jews that pray like us, Jews that think like us, and those who, and those who, who don't. One of the topics that he didn't explore quite as fully as a contemporary uh, adherent of modern orthodoxy might, and this is probably a function of the decades in which he was involved and the way things have changed, is the role of women. He spoke about it. He came to understand its significance as something to which we should turn our attention later in his, in his career. Again, it's a function of the decades in which he, he was in his prime and uh, the degree to which the status and role of women and women's leadership and women's learning has uh, has evolved over those times, but clearly that's identified as as one of the the factors uh, as well. So all of these things together um, are some of the things that he identifies as the kind of makeup of modern orthodoxy. But more than anything else, when kind of put together, he points to the value of moderation. Moderation in everything. But he bemoaned the fact that people misunderstood that as a kind of wimpishness, right? That was the term he used. He said, being moderate doesn't mean you're a wimp, right? It doesn't mean that you don't have hard fought and strongly developed attitudes and positions to which you are prepared to, to, uh, to fight and defend. But moderation means that when taken overall, and my essay kind of goes into this at a little greater depth than, than we're able to get into now in this conversation, but playing off of ideas, and, and here there's, there's no doubt that, that he was profoundly influenced by his great teacher, Rabbi Soloveitchik. And he took many of those central ideas from Rabbi Soloveitchik's teachings and developed them further and tried to put them into his own words. And put them into action in certain ways is this idea of, of moderation, but moderation not as some kind of mechanical or mathematical averaging out, but a kind of balancing of all of life's concerns and competing commitments uh, to find a, a, a way through. That's how he defines Maimonides' famous golden mean or the golden, the golden path, the central way um, and that led him in the, uh, in the late 80s, early 90s, to attempt a rebranding and to suggest that we no longer call ourselves modern Orthodox, but centrist Orthodox. And this rebranding, you know, like, like, most, um, like most corporate rebrandings re are met with, uh, frankly, with a bit of cynicism. Uh, you remember, I mean, people of a certain age will remember New Coke, right? The idea that Coca-Cola was going to rebrand and, and tinker with its uh, formula and the rebranding was going to change something. Or when, uh, when Google, you know, redesigns its logo, even by, you know, shifting, you know, the, the shape and letters by a millimeter or changing, you know, the, the, the slightly the hue of the colors in the Google logo, this leads to endless Talmudic analysis of the, of the Google, of the Google logo, but it didn't stick. People didn't understand what he was saying. And late in his career, he, late in his career, he, he acknowledged 
that uh, that that this uh, that this rebranding, which was again clearly not just for marketing, uh, not just for marketing purposes, but uh, because he thought it was going to help us reshape the way we conceive of the values of of the of the religious of the religious community he wrote in uh, in 2002 he, he wrote the following for a while i rejected the title modern orthodox because i considered the adjective modern to be objectionable it appeared as if we were boasting of our modernity when indeed we were hardly uncritical of it even though we stand for engaging in engaging in it, engaging in, in modernity, that is, openly and forthrightly. Now, as he said, he didn't like the term modern orthodox because people misunderstood the term modern orthodox to mean that we're modern in all ways, but we just try to keep the dictates of the Shulchan Aruch. He says, no, in other words, we are not modern in all ways. Anyone whose prime commitments are to Torah can never be fully modern. Right? So, so the, the, the term was misunderstood. He says, in other words, he said that in other words, people thought modern orthodoxy meant some kind of like pariv commitment to old values. He says, that's not what it is at all. I therefore introduced the term centrist orthodoxy, intending not a mathematical mean between two extremes, but those who follow Maimonides' principle of moderation. However, this did not prove to be an inspired decision. Most people assumed it meant we were, we were situating ourselves midway between reform Jews and Satmer Hasidim. Nothing, of course, could be more wrongheaded. I have therefore reverted to the term modern orthodoxy. But more significant, I think he came to a realization that these kinds of discussions are, are ultimately distracting. When we focus too much on form, when we focus too much on names, when we focus too much on, on the, the trappings of, of, of branding, we lose sight of content. We lose sight of substance. And it was therefore around this time in the late 80s that he turned to perhaps his greatest intellectual project, which was Torah Umada. For many decades, this slogan, Torah Umada, was on the uh, banner, or the logo of Yeshiva University, the institution which he, he came to head in 1976 as the third university president of the of the institution but unlike most university presidents uh uh you know the the average tenure I, I think that this statistic is right i think in the united states the average tenure of a university president is about seven years because it's just exhausting you know the just the financial pressure of keeping an institution of higher education afloat is, is just overwhelming rabbi lamb stayed in the job for nearly a quarter century and his predecessors had also been uh, long lived in, in the job because when there's a kind of correlation between ideological investment, particularly of a religious variety and the institution, the head of the university is not, is not only the fundraiser in chief. He's the person with his, his hand on the, on the rudder of an entire, entire spiritual world. Right? In other words, the head of Yeshiva University is, is somehow titularly the head of worldwide modern orthodoxy to one degree, to one degree or, or another. So he turns his attention to this, this slogan, this Torah Umada, which again had, had you know, graced the logo of the university for many decades, but hadn't really meant much. People didn't use the term. People didn't engage with it. You know, if you look on... If you look on the logos of many universities, there are all types of slogans, which, you know, are usually merely, merely that. And he took this idea, Torah Umada, which, you know, can be interpreted in various ways. It can mean Torah and science. It can mean Torah and wisdom. It can mean, you know, Torah and, and actually modernity. I mean, I don't mean it could mean that literally, but, but it could stand for those ideas. And he began to explore, well, what does that mean? How has it historically played itself out? How has it historically been rejected and criticized and, and critiqued and, 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 and uh, uh, you know, come into conflict with, with religious life and, and, and learning? And he creates a project uh, which coincided with my own arrival uh, as a 
university freshman in the late 1980s uh, at Yeshiva College in New York. Uh, the Torah Umada project, where he invited the community to engage with itself, to think deeply about what does this mean? What does a slogan mean? Uh, when you start peeling away the layers of the onion to get at core values, to get at the kind of beating heart of who we ought to be as a, as a, as a religious entity, as a spiritual entity. And we're going to argue about it. We're going to debate it. We're going to think about it. And we're not going to agree. And out of that, out of that messy engagement, we're going to come to a deeper and richer and thicker uh, understanding of who we are and who we want to be as a, as a community. And out of these conversations and his writings and, uh, and, uh, and you know, the work on this came a book called Torah Umada, which has now been published, I think, in a few different editions. Um, but it was his presentation of different models of how Torah and Mada, Torah and Western culture, Torah and general knowledge, Torah and science have interacted throughout, throughout the millennia long Jewish experiment. And people misunderstood the book. The book was like thought to be some kind of proscriptive model for what we ought to do, which of course can't be because he presented competing models or it was presented as a kind of, I don't know, uh, what they used to call Chinese menu, select one from column A and one from column B and one from column C. Um, you know, these are the different categories of Toru Mada and, and we could, we could uh, you know, mix and match, but it, it wasn't. It was this kind of engagement with trying to think about how has this played out historically and what should we be aware of as we think about it for our own age? Um, and I think this was, you know, the really significant turn in, in, in what he was doing. He was saying, let's, let's stop talking around the topic and let's get at it, right? To paraphrase the late great of Moshe Bezdin, who was a significant figure in the world of Yeshiva University, who said about Torah study that it should be it, not about it. You know, Torah, you know what Torah study is. All these books behind me, it's rolling up your sleeves and doing the hard work of engaging with texts and trying to decipher their meaning and trying to make that translation for what it means to our world. And then there's the kind of, the kind of Torah study where we just kind of talk around things. So in the same way, Rabbi Lamb said, we need it. We need Torah Umada, it, not about it. Let's not talk about are we modern Orthodox or centrist Orthodox or should we call ourselves by this name or that name? Should we jiggle with the logo? No, let's talk about that value. Let's engage with the value itself. And this was actually um, a very convenient, uh, I would say not, not profitable. It was useful. It was productive uh, to move away from talking about things to talking about ideas for which he was beginning to be criticized from both the left and the right. He, he once jokingly said that uh, he's, uh, he's an equal opportunity target. He's, he's criticized both from those on his right and his, and his left. And instead to move to the world where he, he probably felt most comfortable, which was engaging with ideas, with, with religious philosophy. Um, so that, that's kind of a shape, the shape of his engagement with, with this particular topic and how he got to that. Because at the core, he's focused on this idea of centrism. Mm. So that's, that's how he comes to this term, which he's borrowing from, from, uh, from uh, uh, um, um, uh, Murray Butler, who had been was a longtime president of, of Columbia University who also had a very long, I think he was like the president of Columbia for uh, like four decades or something in the beginning of the 20th century. So that phrase, which Rabbi Lamb uh, borrowed and which I took as the title of the essay, the, the, extremes, uh, the extremes are more consistent, but absurd, really comes to, to symbolize, you know, what he thought about, about extremism uh, of, of all varieties 
and for the need for moderation in religious life. So on, on that theme, and, and I'm very conscious of time, and my, unfortunately my computer robbed us for five minutes, but maybe we'll seek everyone's grace for an extra five minutes at the end. Um, you speak of Rabbi Lam as an equal opportunity target and, and the extremists from both sides coming in on him. So I, I'm wondering if you can compare the extremes that he was experiencing some decades ago with the challenges, the real challenges, not the surface challenges about naming rights, but the real and substantial challenges that modern orthodoxy faces today? Well, I, I wouldn't want to get into uh, an argument. I wouldn't want to invite, you know, the critiques of those on my left and right, because, you know, first of all, the contours of, of left and right and who's occupying each position have shifted so much over the, over the years. But uh, I, I think that, you know, decades ago, when tradition was launched in the late 50s, it was a very bold undertaking because who thought that there'd be an audience for a journal of intellectual orthodox Jewish thought? And who thought that there, it would still be a going concern over six decades later when the best predictions in the, in the 50s were that orthodoxy was what was, what was called a movement in decline? And the best sociological predictors were saying in a generation or two, there would be no orthodoxy left in, in North America. And we can only imagine what they would have predicted for Australia. Right? That uh, maybe aside from a pocket here and there on the Lower East Side of Manhattan or maybe Williamsburg, Brooklyn, there would be no orthodoxy. And what happened? The unimaginable. Now, the unimaginable came about because of the, the heroic work of figures like Rabbi Lamb and Rabbi Soloveitchik and other community builders and principally the day school movement more than perhaps more than anything else and possibly the, the, uh, the value of the year of study abroad in Israel, which has gone on to have such positive, profound impact in religious communities around the world in, in North America and in Australia and elsewhere. Uh, but the idea that there's Torah and Kashrut and Mikvaot and Yeshivot and day schools and summer camps and you name it in the most unlikely places. I mean, even, even in the last 30 years that I've been living in Israel for nearly 30 years and I go back, I was recently in America for the first time in, since before Corona. It was the longest extended period since I've come to live in Israel that I've been absent from America. And I'm shocked by what I, what I find, right? you know, places where shuls are growing and communities are growing and, uh, you know, places which, you know, when I was a, a, a kid in New Jersey back in the 80s, places that had barely a, a minion of, of, of 10 old men, you know, would gather uh, to keep the lights on in a shul. And now it's thriving, and uh, you know there are more uh, there are more shalom zachers and 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 bris milas than than funerals. That's the tipping point in the health of a of a community, I suppose. And there are day schools sprouting up. Uh, it's it's just unimaginable. So I think the nature of how we are uh, opposed, both from right and left, today, I think we're in a just a, I think orthodoxy is just in a different position uh, because we're in such a, a much healthier place. Um, obviously there are still problems and there are challenges and there are things that we have to be, be, you know, be mindful of, and we have to be very self-critical of, and we shouldn't become God forbid complacent. There's so many, you know, with, with all that success come other problems that, that we didn't know about problems of the consumer culture, economic problems, uh, that sometimes warp our, our values, degrees to which we feel more secure with ourselves in the public sphere, degrees to which the questions of, of universalism and particularism and the degree to which we are a little bit more closed in at home and a little more open to the world play out in, in sometimes very unpredictable ways, ways that we've become open to the wide world, not in the best ways, and ways that we've been closed off uh, in our own little Dalit Amot in, in ways that distort, um, you know, some of the central value, val central values of the, 
community. Uh, our listeners are, are, are asked to pay attention to what we'll be publishing in upcoming issues of Tradition. These are topics that we're going to be exploring in depth. So if you go to traditiononline.org and subscribe now, you won't miss those articles that will be coming out on those uh, subjects. Um, so I, I think that, you know, just the reality is different, that the nature of the critique is, is, is it's a different world. So it's difficult to compare to, you know, what was happening back in the 50s, 60s and, and, and 70s. But that being said, that being said, you know, there's no doubt that, uh, that there's critique that's made of our community. I, I've just, you know, I've just at least obliquely referred to some things from the inside. Um, and I think it's good to be attentive to the critique of our, of our, uh, of our, our brothers and sisters, right? Jews to the right of us and Jews to the left of us are not our enemies. They're not even our rivals. They're our brothers and sisters. And uh, their critiques are sometimes unfounded. Sometimes they're unfair. Often they're the function of misunderstanding something about the religious life to which we are committed. Um, but there's value in paying attention to how we are seen in the eyes of others. Because the one thing we know is we don't always get it right. And uh, using the lens of how we're viewed by others helps us to, to be better. And, and I think that you know, we can do it you know, from, a, from a place of, of strength because things are actually, you know, I think we have a lot to be optimistic about in terms of the state of, of, uh, of the religious community worldwide. Thank you. Um, we have a couple of minutes, I hope, to invite some questions from the audience. Um, you can either post a question in the chat or you can turn your camera on and wave at us instead. Um, okay, I'm going to leave that opening open for a minute. Um, but I, I'll, um, I wanted to ask, just following on from what you just said about, you know, these are some of the issues that we're going to delve into in tradition in the near future, what's the next two of those that are coming up, those, those, focus, those focal points um, that reflect so the it, challenges? It happens that we have, uh, it was not, I can't claim, you know, the, the, um, the strong hand of the editor's leadership uh, here uh, because uh, it wasn't planned, but we have a number of essays that have, uh, that have come in and are now coming up for publication on these topics of you know, universalism and particularism or of religious pluralism. Um, and you know, when that happens, you know, sometimes we commission a special issue. There's some, there's some topics that we want to explore and we turn to five or 10 or 12 people and ask them to write about it. Um, and then other times you, you, know, you can look at the... Uh, you can look at the tables of contents. I, when I became the editor of the journal a number of years ago, I was gifted a copy of the entire collection of, uh, of tradition going back 64 years. It takes up a whole uh, couple of shelves in, in the next room. Um, and sometimes it's, I, I go and I stand before the bookshelf and I page through the tables of contents. You can also, by the way, you can do this uh, digitally. The whole, the whole, uh, the whole catalog is available uh, on the archives at traditiononline.org. You can go through and sample all the back issues and everything's been digitized and you can get, get all of our back issues. Uh, but when, you, when you're actually holding the physical books and you can page through them one by one in chronological order, it's a time capsule. You, you see topics that were, that were uh, important, that they were on the agenda that seems so frankly, bizarre to us, um, you know, particularly things, trends in culture and society. Uh, back in the early 60s, there was a lot of attention being paid, for example, to the topic of cryogenic freezing. Mm -hmm. it, it was this technology that was promised to be this, you know, life-altering uh, thing that, you know, as you were about to die, they would freeze you in, in uh, I don't know exactly how it worked, and your body would be put into a state of stasis. And then in future centuries, it's the stuff of science fiction. Uh, in future centuries, when they find the cure for whatever ailed you, they can take you out of the freezer and, uh, uh, and, and, and you'll come back to life. And this was a fad in America. People were talking, I think there are actually a few people that had this done and it paid in perpetuity to have their body kept you know, in, in the deep freeze. Um, uh, but you know, just like the rest of the world, Judaism only more so. Uh, so you can find articles, 
you know, addressing this topic of like Judaism's attitude towards cryogenic, uh, cryogenic freezing. So now we look at that and we think that's, that's, really that's, just, that's just bizarre that we would have published whatever it was, three, three articles on this particular topic, yeah. but going back in the archives. But sometimes when that happens, it, um, it, it tells you more about what was going on you know, in the in the schools and synagogues, in the in the in the street of of uh, of our the lives of our readership. So so now we have these uh, this cluster of essays that have come about on these topics of, of particularism, universalism, uh, uh, pluralism. Um, to what degree we're open to the world? To what degree we're shut off from the world? Um, how that's been interpreted historically? Uh, how other thinkers in the past, you know, have touched it and and how their thinking might influence how we think how we think about it um the in the in our last issue there was a, a very interesting significant uh, essay i mentioned earlier rabbi jonathan sachs uh, who who was often both uh misunderstood and criticized for his views and teachings on religious pluralism um and that was done by a very fine young uh, uh, philosopher named Sam Lebens, who's here in, in Israel at the University of Haifa, uh, who tried to set the record straight on what Rabbi Sachs was really doing and, and why it's important that we not misunderstand or, or misinterpret him. Um, and that plays into these larger conversations. And uh, we have a few pieces coming out on how this played out in the thought of, of Rav Kook, you know, who, of course, along with Rabbi Soloveitchik, remains, you know, the towering figure in 20th century uh, Jewish thought and why it's profitable to go back and re-examine those ideas and try to make applications to our to our uh, our own day um, uh, so those are so the fact that these these articles are kind of bubbling up you know from the surface uh, says something about what are the what are the why are the brightest minds in in our in our community focusing on this topic? Uh, you know, how does it serve as a lens back onto what's happening, you know, in the street and in the school and in the shul? Um, and then so, how, how can it help us think more carefully about them? I, I, in a similar vein, I think a question from David Prince asking you to please expand on how the balance in the modern Orthodox world, the balance of thought leadership between Israel and the diaspora is changing. And, and I'm going to have to ask you for a brief answer on that because otherwise I'll get in trouble for going over time at the other end. Um, but the, the look, I think that change between yeah, Israel yeah, and the yeah. I mean, I think that uh, you know, there's a very, a, a very significant community of people here in Israel. I mean, I'm in Israel for the first time in its long history. The editor of the journal uh, sits in the United States, even though it, it is published by the Rabbinical Council of America, which is America's North America's leading rabbinic uh, body. Um, uh, but nevertheless, I'm situated here. But we do live in a kind of, you know, global world. Um, you know, when I think of how my predecessors, you know, going back to Rabbi Lamb could have possibly edited a journal without, you know, without the internet, without email, without instantaneous communication, where an author would write and type an article, uh, put it into an envelope, mail it, the editor would write on that and mail it back. Uh, it's, it's just impossible. Um, so I think we live in a global world, but there's no doubt that there's a certain center of gravity even within the Anglo world of publishing articles in English pitched to the Anglo world worldwide, which is, of course, as, as far away as Sydney, Australia, um, which not for you, but for the rest of us is really quite far away. Um, but I think you, we, we you know exactly how far away we are. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, but if you look at your table of content, the tables of contents, you'll see that there's a certain percentage uh, of authors uh, who are here in Israel, you know, uh, Anglo Saxons. Who are here in uh, in Israel um, uh, that are that are writing and speaking and having an influence uh, worldwide? Okay, thank you. Um, I'd love to continue the conversation, but um, we our time is up. We appreciate you very much taking time out of out of your day. We appreciate people um, coming in from America, where it's very early in the morning, and you from Israel, where it's lunchtime, as well as those of us. In Australia, where it's the end of the day, um, thank you for well, thank you for talking to us tonight and giving us um, such fascinating insight into the way the volume came together and your thoughts about the legacy of Rabbi Lamb and the role of tradition 
in carrying on that legacy and doing what it does so beautifully. Um, and so, yeah, thank you for thank you for being the inspiration behind the 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 whole enterprise of this edition, which has I think given us here in Sydney a, a real window into tradition itself. So. Um, Okay. Fascinating. Well, thank again, you thank much. thank you to you, Jackie, and to and to Rabbi Meltzer for his leadership in this initiative, this partnership. We're very glad, and I just uh, again remind all of our our listeners and viewers uh, who get to this through the archive to visit traditiononline.org, uh, and you know even if you don't subscribe to the print journal, um, you can you can have a digital subscription which uh, you know, would allow you instant access to the new material as it's published uh, online, uh, because there is sometimes a shipping delay to, to Australia. Uh, but, but more important, to subscribe online to our newsletters, to get updated on everything that's happening in the journal, uh, to be notified when we, when we publish, as we do, two or three times a week, original digital content directly on, online. Um, a whole variety of things that we just don't have room for uh, in the print journal or things that can't suffer the delay of waiting for the next quarterly issue to, to come out and uh, to find us on Facebook and give us a like to keep updated on everything that's happening in the Journal of Orthodox Jewish Thought. Thank you very much. There's lots of thank you messages in the chat as well. Um, thank you to everybody for attending. Um, please join us next week.